Thank you very much for that warm introduction. No pressure, no pressure. So it's Father's Day, as you may have gathered already, and this is very exciting. As my kids will tell you, uh, I, as a father, I like to try and make it my responsibility to tell as many horrific dad jokes as I possibly can throughout the week. And uh, whenever I do, I always get a brilliant eye roll from the, from the children. My daughter is a teenager, so it's, you know, genetically teenagers have perfected the art of the eye roll. So whenever I say a bad dad joke, I get this, oh, dad, like that. And then, yes, dad has told another bad joke. But today is Father's Day. So I thought I would celebrate Father's Day by spending the whole day telling awful dad jokes. Yes. And I've got some for you this morning. There we go. Actually, this is one that my son told me. What do you call a balloon dad? A balloon dad. Pops. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that was a better reaction than I thought I was going to get. So there we go. Here's one, here's one that uh, is probably relevant for, for me standing up here this morning. A pastor comes up and stands in front of his church and says, I've got what I've got for you this morning. I've got a hundred dollar sermon that lasts for five minutes. I've got a fifty dollar sermon that lasts for ten minutes. And I've got a twenty dollar sermon that lasts for twenty minutes. We're about to take the collection and that will decide which one you get. No, okay, all right, all right, we'll, we'll leave that. It's obviously going downhill. Anyway, my children can look forward to some further bad jokes later on this afternoon. So we're going to start right at the very beginning. And actually, so we're going to start in Genesis chapter 1. And actually, I've been dwelling on Genesis an awful lot over the last few months or, or year or however long it was. And I think the reason for that is because Genesis is really important for us as a society today in our culture because our culture has forgotten so much hasn't it about who we are and why we are here and who God is and and what we are here to do and so it stands to reason and actually where God sets that all out and starts everything off actually there's so much truth in Genesis that we have forgotten as a society and I think uh, you know I'm sort of dwelling on that and bringing out that truth. It's vital to remember how it all started and what God's original plan was for us as humanity, as people. You know, what are we here to do? So in Genesis 1, 28, and I have just realized I didn't ask anyone to put the verses up on the board. So I'm very sorry about that. We might, has everybody got their Bibles with you? Well done over there. Well done, James. If everybody's got your Bibles, you might have to turn with me and we can uh, read them together. So Genesis 1, 28. I'll give you a few minutes to, uh, to look it up. Genesis 1, 28 says this. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And oh, well, oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Who's, whoever's on the desk, what a brilliant job you're doing. Thank you. That is amazing. So let's read it again. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth and subdue it using all its vast resources in the service of God and man and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves upon the earth. So this is the, one of the very first commissions that God gives to, to mankind, to people. And it says, go and be fruitful, multiply, make more copies of yourselves. And that's, I think that's really interesting because we know also from Genesis, don't we, that God made man in his own image, didn't he? So actually what he's, what he's telling Adam and Eve in the story of Genesis is actually saying, go and make more copies of my image in the world. He's saying, I want more a family that, that looks like me, that represents me, that carries my, my glory, my image on the earth. 
And he says, go forth. And it's your job, your job, guys, to go forth and make, make little mini Adams and Eves who will also carry my image and bring about a family of God, a heavenly domain on earth. And I can imagine Adam listening to that commission and I can imagine the look on his face and he turns to Eve and he gives Eve a little look and said, well, Eve, you heard the man. Let's get busy. And I can imagine the look on Eve's face after Adam had said that when she turns around and says, I'd like to see you carry all those babies. So this is the very first commission. One of our primary things that we were given to do is to fill the earth with God's image. Now you can't fulfill that commission without fathers, can you? You need fathers to make other little people. So right from the beginning, men are bestowed with this huge honor, this noble commission to, to, to reflect the face of God and to reproduce others who also reflect the face of God. Because fathers are there to, to be like God, aren't we? Yeah. You know, God is our heavenly father. Yeah. And so the, the fathers on earth are here to be like God, to represent God on the earth. So as you can imagine, the Bible paints a, a wonderful picture of fathers. They, they're supposed to model a godly life. As we say, as fathers are supposed to model what God is like. They should teach children then in the way they should go. Teach them between right and wrong. Teach them values, what is important, what is not important. You know, I learned a lot of things from, from my father. You know, I learned, one of the things I learned was how important it was to go to church, how, how it had to be a part of the or sort of routine and, the, you know, that, that, was the, that was the default. You go to church, you know, that was it. And it, it wasn't because he sat me down one day and said to me, Johnny, you know what? It's really important to go to church. That wasn't, he may well have done that, I don't remember. But that's not how I learned. Actually, I learned it from him because every Sunday... It was my dad who got us out of bed and took us to church. I learned that value not because of what he said to me, but because of what I saw in him and that established and instilled something in me. I say it was him that got us out of bed. Actually, it was probably my mum. My dad tended to just stand at the bottom of the stairs and shout, Right, we're off! <laughs> and then, the, well, mum got us all dressed. But that's, that's by the by. And similarly... We learnt the importance of reading our Bibles. I learnt that from my father. And again, it wasn't because he sat down and said, Johnny, it's important to read your Bible. It's because I saw him reading his Bible. And because when we got together as a family, he would take out his Bible and we would read it together. And it used to drive me mad when we were on holidays and he would insist on carrying on doing it. And there was me as a little child squirming and thinking, why aren't we on the beach enjoying the sunshine? And my dad was there with his Bible. Let's just have a little time, a few minutes, reading the word and praying. And I, but you know, that, that taught me. His, he could have spoken until he was blue in the mouth about how important reading the Bible was. But if I never saw him doing it, if I never saw him pick up that Bible, it would have meant nothing. It would have meant nothing. And I wonder what I'm passing on to my kids. What are they watching me doing? And I can tell to them, I can say to them, it's important to come to church. It's important to pray. It's important to read your Bible. But if every time they see me, they see me staring like this at the telly or, uh, you know, on my phone, it's not going to mean anything, is it? So, well, I'll, you can ask Abby what she's learning from me afterwards and you can check me out. I hope it won't be too bad. <laughs> So fathers instill values in their children. They also tell, bring their children up about how to function in the world. You know, be a, be a productive adult and being a member of the community. They pass on discipline. Of course, that's an unpopular one, isn't it? But uh, that's something that fathers have to do. And, and, you know, what this list could apply to mothers as well. But as it's Father's Day, you know, we're focusing on, on the one. We have to provide discipline. And children without discipline go wrong. It's a responsibility for fathers to, 
to bring it. Fathers provide for their children. They pray for them. They have compassion on them. They show the compassion of God. Fathers never give up. And they work to see their children stand on their shoulders to do even more than what their fathers did before them. That is what a father does. That's, that's quite a responsibility, isn't it? What a, what a noble picture the Bible paints of fatherhood. And I couldn't find the verse, but I'm pretty sure there's something in there as well about how fathers need to tell bad jokes to their children as well. Perhaps you could help me find the verse afterwards, Rob, and um, I'll let you know where that is. Key. <laughs> Don't provoke your children. Yeah. Okay. Key parenting advice there. The trouble is, so it's, the trouble is, we live in an increasingly fatherless generation, don't we? Whereas the, whereas the Bible paints this wonderful, noble picture of fatherhood, actually, we live in a culture in a generation where fatherhood is devalued. It's not recognised as it was as this as this noble thing. And our society, you could say, our society perhaps has a has a much more casual approach to family as it, as it might have done in years gone by. You know, perhaps fathers are not a presence in the house anymore. Or perhaps there are men in the house who aren't necessarily the biological father. You know, there's not, perhaps not quite the same connection between the, between the stepdad and the, uh, and the children. Or perhaps the father was only around for conception, you know, did, did, made a donation and, uh, and never saw each other again. Or more, more recently, the father doesn't even have to be there for that, do they? Right. But, uh, you know, we, we live in a culture which devalues the role of fatherhood. And so children grow up without that role model in their life. Not knowing, particularly boys, I think, grow up not really knowing how men are supposed to behave. How fathers are supposed to behave. Not knowing how to be dads because they haven't seen it from their own father. And so the cycle continues and we get sort of generations of, of men who don't know how to be men, yeah. of yeah. men who don't know what God has called them to be. Yeah. That's right. And that's a real problem because as we saw in Genesis, fathers and men are called to represent the image of God. They are the earthly representatives of our heavenly father. And so, children, this is interesting, children can actually learn what God is like by watching their fathers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was, in my case, that was quite good because I had a kind and compassionate father. So I grew up understanding that God was actually a kind and compassionate God. I knew that I was loved, that God was, that God was loving and that he loved me. But others might grow up thinking that God is, is absent. Or perhaps feeling that God, God doesn't love them or accept them. Or particularly if you have an abusive father, that God is, is angry or a hard taskmaster or, or cruel. So we might struggle to relate to God or feel loved and accepted by him. And in the same way, it's our fathers, just as our fathers represent God to our children. So it's our fathers who help give us our identities as well. It's our fathers who tell us we are sons. It's our fathers who tell us we are daughters. And because, because the father is, represents the face of God, it's, the, it's almost like it's the face of God speaking this identity into our children. You are my son. You are my daughter. And I think, now I haven't got any data to, to share, but I, it would be really interesting to do a study on um, society because we're, the identity crisis that we're seeing around us in society, I suspect that's largely due to the fact that we don't have fathers telling us who we are. And so we end up, you know, we have, a, we have a sexual identity crisis and a gender identity crisis and whatever other crisis to do with our identities. 
And I think that might be because we're grasping around trying to find answers to the most basic questions. It's because we don't have father figures in our lives telling us, this is who you are. You are loved. You are mine. This is you. So we end up not in a secure place because we don't know who we are and where we came from. Okay, all with me so far? So we're going to shift gears slightly now. So we had the first commission. The first commission was go forth and multiply. Make little copies of yourselves in the world. Make copies of God's image. But this is the second commission that we have. We have to skip forward a few thousand years. And this is another great commission that Jesus gave to his disciples in Acts 1, verse 8. If you turn to that in your Bibles, I'm wondering if they Oh, look at that. It comes up on the screen. That is amazing. So this is another commission that Jesus gives to his disciples. And you shall receive power, ability, efficiency, and might. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends, the very bounds of the earth. Do you notice how similar that is to the very first commission that we were given in Genesis? You will be my witnesses and you are going to populate the whole earth with disciples. And what, and what is a disciple if not somebody who has been reborn in the image of God? So in many, oh, thank you. appreciate <laughs> that clap. And it, so in many ways, this is the same commission, isn't it? Except this time, it's not, it's not about having babies. Yeah. Well, sort of, spiritual, but it's about going and making disciples of other people. To, to, to create a family for God who carry the image of God. So that God will once again have a family. Some, a family that represents him on the earth. And bring, you know, his domain on the earth. God's heart is for family. And again, the commission, this commission again, it calls for fathers. Just as we need dads to, to make little... I'm sorry, this is turning into a biology class. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't mean that. Just as we need dads to make little children, we need dads to bring about this, this second commission, don't we? we? But not physical fathers, but we need spiritual fathers. And we need people, and actually this is, this is where it widens out from Father's Day, because this is now not just about men, it is also about women and, you know, old people and young people and whatever, you know, whatever your background. We need people who will love others enough to get involved in their lives and to provide some spiritual parenting so that the image of Christ will develop and mature in the people around us so that we make disciples of the people around us does that make sense yeah. everybody yeah okay everybody's still with me now paul modeled this quite well in the bible paul was a spiritual father to many people he was a spiritual father to timothy he was a spiritual father to the corinthian church he was a spiritual father to many of the churches that he helped establish and built up so in what way was Paul a father? Let's have a little look at that. Well, firstly, he had a relationship with his children. His spiritual, when I say children now, I'm probably going to be in spiritual children. He had a relationship with his children. There's a lovely verse in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 4. This isn't actually in my notes, so if this comes up, I think we should give them a round of applause. 2 Timothy 1, verse 4, Paul writes about how he longs to see Timothy. And he talks about how he remembers the tears on Timothy's face. You know, if you're, if you're crying together, that's not something you do with a, with a work colleague or a mentor, is it? That speaks about a, an intimate relationship where they, there was genuine connection between the two people. I mean, it might happen with a work colleague if they've trodden on your toe or something like that. But, um, you know, it speaks about a connection between the two, that there is a genuine heart for each other, that Paul is, Paul just enjoys Timothy's company. You know, he likes, he likes the guy. He likes being around him. He has a, he longs to see him, and he knows that Timothy will give him comfort when he's, when he's uh, in prison. 
So there's a connection between the two. There's a relationship. But one of the other ways is that Paul admonishes his children. He gives them discipline. And actually, when you read through some of the letters that Paul writes, Paul can be pretty brutal, can't he, when it comes to, when it comes to church discipline. Yeah, he talks about uh, throwing out the, the guy who's living in sin. And he talks about correcting error in the church. He, he calls some people fools and idiots. And he chastises them. You know, Paul knows how to deliver discipline to his children. And I think maybe that's something we need to, uh, to allow in our own lives. There's this very biblical model, isn't there, of allowing people to speak that truth, yeah. that, admonish, that ad, admonishing, admonition, that discipline <laughs> into our lives, and, and us, us be made free through it. And that's very countercultural, isn't it? Very countercultural. We live in a society where any correction, if you go and tell anyone they're doing something wrong, you'll, you'll, you won't get thanked for it. I remember we, had, uh, we were involved in a, in a car accident earlier on in the year, and we, had to, we borrowed a courtesy car while our car was uh, in the shop. And I remember this courtesy car had a feature which our old car didn't, and it told me how well I had been driving at the end of the trip. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now, I can tell you, I did not like my car having an opinion on how well I drove. Wow. This, <laughs> this made me very cross. But doesn't that speak about where we are as a society? Yeah. You know, this car was trying to be helpful. <laughs> you know, if you just do this, just accelerate a little bit slower. It probably tells you a lot about my driving. Perhaps I should have a confessional afterwards. But we get so offended, don't we, when people come and speak truth to us. Because we, we don't want to hear it. We get very offended. But actually, the Bible talks about the complete opposite. And there's a shocking verse in Proverbs, 9, uh, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8. And it says this. Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man... And he will love you. Yes, yes. Isn't that a shock? He will actually love you. Can you imagine it? Going down the street and saying to someone, actually you're doing this wrong, you could do it like that. Can you imagine if someone turns around and said, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I will do that. You've changed my life. You'd get a punch in the face, wouldn't you, from most people. Or you, well, hopefully you wouldn't from me. But, I, you know, I'm not sure I'd be initially pleased. <laughs> What a difference, what a cultural difference the Bible is to the uh, society around us. And I think the question for me and for us is, are we in that place where we could accept that sort of correction from someone in a positive way? Can we imagine ourselves, if, if someone brings us discipline, that we would actually turn around and say thank you and accept it with joy? And then the other question in my mind is, who are we in a relationship with that we could accept that sort of discipline from? Yeah. Who is looking out for us and feels able to speak into our lives in that way? And this has been quite a challenge for me. You know, I, I tend to get cross even when my wife tells me I'm doing the washing up wrong. You know, and that's, <laughs> you know, that's trivial, isn't it? We're, we're talking about life changes. So, what have we said so far? The father loves his children, enjoys them, has a relationship with them. A father brings discipline. But a father also has a desire to bring his children to maturity. He wants them to do well. You know, actually, I feel very lucky to be in a church which cares about me enough to want to see me come to maturity. And I know that... Uh, you know, I know without a shadow of a doubt that Rob and Judy have been praying for me this morning. And I know that they would bring me rebuke if I needed it, if it felt it was necessary. And I know that Rob and Judy are interested in stretching me in things that I'm currently not 
uh, doing. So, for instance, we've got doing the, uh, the Bible school in a, in a week's time. You know, something that I'm not as familiar with as, as preaching in front of a church. But, you know, Rob is, is, cares about me enough to push me into that and say, oh, Johnny, give this a go. And, it, you know, it might be a complete disaster. We'll, <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> but if it is, I know that, I think I know that Rob will, will help me through that, you know, and provide some... Uh, well, <laughs> well, well, we'll see what we'll, we'll see what turns out. But you know, I feel blessed to be in a place where somebody can, loves me enough to speak into my life and, and you know, look for change and look for maturity. And I know Rob's not Rob and Judy aren't the only ones. And I feel very lucky to be in Mike and Karen's group as well. Mike's not here today, so I can say what I like about him. But. Uh, but Mike would often say to the group, he doesn't feel like he's a teacher, which I find completely bizarre because uh, he, he's teaching every day, you know, on the WhatsApp group and in the, in the core group and in the bros. You know, if, if he's not a teacher, then uh, <laughs> I don't know who is. But more than that, I think Mike models being a spiritual father really well. You know, yeah, yeah, we have deserves a round of applause. So he takes on... He, he takes on all the, the bros, you know, he's a spiritual dad to all the bros and he invites them in his house and he has meals with them and he shares a relationship with them and he has our core group round and he, he gets stuck into our lives. You know, he's been round to visit us and, and Karen as well and, you know, they, they care enough about us to get stuck in, to roll their sleeves up and, and see the people that they're connected with change and come to maturity. And I think that's a, such a wonderful model of spiritual fatherhood in the church. And I, yeah, and I, I want to honour Mike and in, uh, in Karen and what they do in that. So it, um, it's a brilliant example. So, a spiritual father wants to see his children do well. And Paul talks about this as well. He talks about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 11 to 12. He says this. For you know... Oh, wonderful. For you know how as a father dealing with his children, we used to exhort each of you personally, stimulating and encouraging and charging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and the glorious blessedness into which true believers will enter after Christ's return. So Paul was also invested in other people's lives. Spiritual fathers are invested in other people's lives, you know, to an extent where it has to get a little bit messy. You know, they're not just making suggestions from the background, you know, they're walking with their children through their situations and in their lives and in their problems. And it's not because they're, not because they're busybodies, not because they're control freaks, it's because they genuinely care enough about their spiritual children to want to see them succeed. And it's a true sign. I think this is one of the, the truest signs of a spiritual father. Is that when you, when you see the people around you go on to do even greater things than you would do. That actually you can respond to that with genuine joy. And not, <laughs> and not jealousy or, or insecurity. That you can take joy in the success of your spiritual children. That sounds good. I mean, it's, it's quite a thing, isn't it? What a noble task to take on. But it turns out that spiritual fathers in the church are, are just as important as early fathers. And just as with our earthly fathers, you know, if, if we don't have a spiritual father, actually it can stunt our growth. It can stunt our maturity. And that's even more important where we live in a in a society where earthly fathers may not be present or may be distant, absent or abusive, whatever it might be, this is where the church can step up and fill in that gap which uh, society has left yeah. to provide that sort of spiritual fatherhood that otherwise people may have missed out on. Yeah. So spiritual fathers are vital and the church can step up and fill the gap. But there aren't many around, are there? 
And in fact, Paul complains about that as well in 1 Corinthians 4. He says to the Corinthians, you know what? You've got so many teachers, but you've got no fathers. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. I think that's really interesting, isn't it? The Corinthians had loads of people who could, who could tell them information. They could, they could preach to them, perhaps. They could, they could tell them what the Bible says. But actually, they didn't have many people who were willing to care about them, who were willing to get stuck into their lives, who would discipline them, who would exhort them, who would want to see them grow and, and become mature. That's exactly what Paul wanted to do. And he says, oh, if only there were more people who could do this in your lives and speak into your lives. And I think that's some of the, one of the key reasons, actually, why some of us don't mature, why some of us don't grow. Actually, because we haven't put ourselves in that position to be fathered by someone else. And we need to make ourselves... We need to make ourselves vulnerable, don't we? To put ourselves in a place where actually we can receive. And we go, you know, build a relationship with this person. And say, you know what? I want to grow. Give me what you've got. And I wonder if there's some people here perhaps who've been sitting in the church for years. And you feel like, actually, well, I'm, I'm not really going anywhere. You know, I'm still in the same place I was a few years ago. And I wonder if that might be because you haven't got that spiritual father in your life speaking into you and, and encouraging you to, to get on and push on and get up pushing you over the next sort of hump in your spiritual development so I guess that is the key question then who is your spiritual father who is the person in your life who you allow to speak into your life, who is invested in seeing you grow and who's ready to sort of get stuck in. Who is that person who you could put yourself under in a place of vulnerability? Who is the person who cheers you along and picks you up and gives you a push? Who is that person you're accountable to? Oh, that's, that's a nasty one, isn't it? But, you know, I have to tell you, when I've struggled with sins in my life, it's been one of the hardest things to do, to, to, to lay down my pride and go to someone in the church and say, you know what, I'm actually struggling with this. I'm doing this. But it's been such a release as well to have someone who can actually come up to me on a Sunday and say, Johnny, how are you doing with this? And I, sometimes I might look a little sheepish and sometimes <laughs> I can say, ah, oh, it's been better. Having somebody accountable to can transform us. Someone to challenge us when we struggle with sin. So who is our spiritual father? That's one question. The other question though is, as I wrap up, is who are our spiritual sons? And who are our spiritual daughters? Because I think that actually... It's not just about putting ourselves in a position of submission to someone else. But actually it's about being available for other people, isn't it? And obviously it's not appropriate for everyone. You know, if you've, if you've just become a Christian, yeah, there's probably a lot to learn. And <laughs> but if you have something in Christ, and if you've been a Christian for a while, then you have got something to pass on to somebody else. And you have got something in Christ, something of Christ's image that you can see, develop and grow in someone else. So who are your spiritual children? Who are you passing on to what you have learned in Jesus? And again, Paul has exactly the same problem. He says in Hebrews chapter 5, he says, we have much to say about this. But it's hard to make it clear to you because you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk. Oh, sorry, I missed a bit. Sorry, read that again. We have much to, 
I'll read it from up here. Uh, concerning this, we have much to say which is hard to explain, since you have become dull in your spiritual hearing and sluggish, even slothful in achieving spiritual insight. For even though by this time you ought to be teaching others, you actually need someone to teach you over again the very first principles of God's word. You have come to need milk and not solid food. And I think there's a great challenge for us here this morning. I think some of us perhaps have been you know, coming to church a long time. We've accumulated a lot of knowledge and we've grown in Christ. And actually the challenge is here by now, you ought to be teaching. And why aren't we? What are we imparting into others that we have learnt? So, being a father then is about replication. And God has called us, each and every one of us, you don't, have to be a, you don't actually have to be a man to respond to this call. God has called each and every one of us to replicate Jesus in other people. To replicate the image of God in other people. To make disciples. To multiply. To be fruitful. Every man, woman, child and grandparent can respond to this call. To reproduce Christ in others. So we'll pray about that later. But also, I think as well, finally, just to say that if you are perhaps one of the many who have not had a great relationship with fathers in your life, or perhaps with other men, perhaps with husbands or brothers or whoever it might be, I just want to share the story of Hagar with you. Because Hagar had a very similar experience. Do you know, she was um, Sarah's slave and Abraham had a son with Hagar. Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham and said, oh, well, have a, let's have a child through Hagar. So Hagar had a son, but it caused, as complicated families can do, it caused problems. And on two separate occasions, Hagar and her son Ishmael were driven out of the camp. And basically Abraham saying, I don't want you here anymore. I will not be your father. I will not be a father to you. And Ishmael had to grow up with that. He had to grow up with being rejected by his father, didn't he? He had to grow up in the, in the desert with just his mum looking after him. And yet, when Hagar was out in the desert, God found them there in the desert and spoke to them. And Hagar said... You are the God who sees me. And I think that might be key for some of us here this morning who haven't had a good relationship with their father. That God is the one who will find you in the desert and he sees you. And so if you are, if you are estranged from your father from your heavenly father now God would say to you today I am the God who sees you you are my adopted son and I will be your father amen amen, amen. so what I mean and there can't be anything better for a father to do is that to be able to represent to be like the heavenly father on earth to be that heavenly father to, to those around us and ultimately, all of us, what we should be celebrating today is, is our earthly fathers as well. But we have earthly fathers because we have such a wonderful heavenly father, don't we? With, who, has, who demonstrates all of these qualities. He wants to invest in us, to see us brought to maturity, to see us as his children in his family. We have a good father, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So I shall, I shall pass over. Is it all right if we pray, yeah, Rob? Yeah, we'll, we'll pray. I'll tell you what, why don't we get, why don't we get the uh, fathers to stand up? Is that, is that all right? Yeah, we'll get the fathers to stand up. So if, I mean, we'll get the physical fathers to stand up. That's quite easy because you just say, have I got children? Yes, oh, I'll stand up. But also, let's get spiritual fathers to stand up as well. You know, if you feel perhaps you are... Being called today to be 
give some spiritual oversight or you feel like God has been giving you a bit of a kick, yes, I should be doing something. Or perhaps you're a core group leader or kids group leader or you know, whatever it might be. You don't have to be a man to respond to that. <laughs> then stand up as well and we'll pray for you as well. Father God, I want to... We just come to our Heavenly Father this morning because we know that you are the best Father anybody could have. And we thank you that we can learn how to be a Father from you. And I just want to release that good fathering on our church this morning. I release over our physical fathers, I release that representing their heavenly, the Heavenly Father through them, that they will be able to father well and take on this noble calling of representing you to their children. And we pray for spiritual fathers as well, that as a, as a church, as men in the church, as women in the church, that we would represent you well to those around us, to those who are young in the faith, to those who are just learning the ropes. I release good fathering from us as a church, that we would step in the gap to be those father figures that are otherwise not around and to speak your truth into people's lives, that we would be brought as a church to maturity. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.